Welcome to the Connected Campus Podcast, where we explore the ways that diverse professionals are working every day to optimize their efforts to recruit, retain, and graduate their students. Our conversation today, I'm very excited to have uh, somebody that I've known of for a long time and had uh, various encounters on podcasts and uh, conferences and different events and everything, and uh, very happy to kind of share her expertise and her experience and her wisdom out uh, with the audience here for the Connected Campus Podcast. So, um, I'll let you do a quick intro of yourself, Josie, uh, of your professional background, how you got to be where you are today, and then we'll get into our conversation centering on digital communities for students in higher education. Well, thanks for the invitation. This is one of my favorite topics to dig into. So my name's Josie Alquis. I'm based in Los Angeles. I worked on a number of campuses for about a dozen years, and then as I got my doctorate, I got the research and consultant bug. And that was 2015, crazy enough. Um, And so since then, I've kind of been on this rogue journey, which like you said, has included podcasting, but also helping campuses be more authentic, consistent. And as this podcast is titled, connected to especially students, whether if it's a campus leader, a Discord server, or, you know, like their social media channels or emails. Um, I've got a couple dogs you might hear in the background. <laughs> um, I have a podcast, Josie and the podcast, and I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I know, um, and I was looking at your LinkedIn too, because I know there's sort of a brief overlap too, like that broadly you've been sort of the you know kind of a consultant speaker you know content creator all the sort of things that you do under your own sort of uh entity and brand like you've been doing that for a decade which is awesome like because i know just somebody else who's just sort of grinding away kind of just you know always sort of doing the side projects that sort of like you know uh are going on as sort of a through line you know and all that um because i feel like the consistency the commitment is like uh always really cool to see well and it's changed so much you and i you know found each other on twitter in the heydays of Twitter and blogging and yeah that and, and there wasn't podcasting I don't think at all no. <laughs> 10 years I yeah. don't know what it was maybe there was I don't know YouTube <laughs> channels but yeah well yeah. Yeah, I think like not as much for sure because that was like the idea where I felt like there wasn't as many people I could talk to about it. And now like I've talked to a lot of people where it's like yeah I started a show here's you know some tips and tricks and whatever and done that so many times but you know and I think it definitely sets up very well the conversation today of like, yeah, we found each other through kind of a a digital professional network on social media, but uh, certainly even just since then, just generally how people uh, sort of build and facilitate and kind of nurture digital communities, especially, uh, you know, for higher institutions has really changed. I think like you even mentioned uh, something like a Discord or Slack or those where it sort of creates a, a more kind of dynamic community experience there, you know, that's something that is, I think, really kind of uh, hit kind of a critical mass or more kind of mainstream uh, utilization. But, you know, we'll start with kind of the just very broad, open-ended question. You know, this is obviously your wheelhouse, your expertise. Like, how do you see these sort of digital communities, whatever shape they take, supporting student success? I think they are a tool like so many others that we have in life and for our campuses that unfortunately may not be as prioritized or seen as serious as, for example, I don't know, like some other kind of office or like new student orientation that, you know, like this is the thing we do and we actually have, you know, publications and research to know the big impact that it makes because, you know, let's say trio programs or like early summer bridge or something like that. Um, And the, uh, the other issue is when, like anything else, when it's not done well, it won't go well. (laughs) If you just throw up a discord and hope for the best, or you all of a sudden think that you can come in as an, as an administrator on Reddit and create a page and then are so surprised why you're not well received. <laughs> um, and social media too, that there are cultural understandings of these tools to navigate and especially to know who you want to connect with and build community for 
there is a lot of entities in higher ed that we can create those and know best practices as professionals, but I find the most engaging, successful digital communities include the community members as core creators and builders. So again, many times that students, but maybe it's a parents group, alumni, something for staff themselves. Um, you, you've you got to get them to be um, part of that process. So we, and, and so we, we tend to hear though more of the failure stories or the struggles, but also like a lot of the tools that we build communities on, we don't own. And so we are at the whim of these changes, whether if it's a Twitter or a TikTok. And so you do got to know kind of what difficulties and lack, you won't have as much control as you might have if it's you know, something in person on your campus, you can control every single little thing. And that can be hard for higher ed people. Yeah. Well, because I think like what you're saying too, where like there's like an earnest intent, like we want to try to build community. So like we're going to maybe kind of make the first move here. And I think that's like the right start is like that you can kind of uh, set it up, create the space for them and and with them, like you said, like that they're sort of uh, a part of that development process of what platform you're using and how you're sort of or you know kind of orchestrating it, whatever. Uh, but then you do want to try to like have that catalyst and let them go with it, so that it is like you know they feel kind of empowered and some ownership and those sort of things. Because I think like the idea of sort of like with these platforms it is sometimes different where yeah maybe if you're doing something in person where you have that ownership and kind of full control over uh all the aspects and details of it you're sort of like you know confined to what that platform is and you might just be like spinning your wheels and you'll you'll do that where it's like well we have these things we just keep trying or whatever it's like well yeah you're just like stuck in the mud and just you keep spinning your wheels you're going nowhere and that's where the sort of like you know the punchline comes from we're just being like oh look at them they're not you know using you know tiktok right or whatever um so you have to like you know create the account and kind of have some like you know ownership on it but then be like yeah you probably should have like your students like you know supported in creating the content like they you know get them the the tripods and the you know whatever equipment and stuff like you're, you're sort of facilitating and sort of you know scaffolding these sort of digital communities to get up because i think you know I, I don't know like if there's just certain examples that you can think of of like you know when these are done well you know it is something that has like i think so many positive impacts just like in and of itself like in and of that digital community and just sort of like the value that people are getting out of it but I think it can have sort of far reaching kind of uh, positive impacts as well. So I don't know, like what kind of comes top of mind when you see this stuff done well, like sort of what's the outcome. So we've seen a number of new student orientation programs incorporate discord and just know that platforms aside, I don't want listeners listening and then like running out <laughs> and creating all these things like, in actuality, we really need to slow down and stop just like gobbling up tools and get way more strategic. What are your goals? Who are your people? Do you have the infrastructure to actually manage a tool? Like any anything that it is. But so the example I'll share is at NYU, their orientation program that rolls into the first year experience. So then again, we're thinking about sustainability. How can we not only put in all this great effort over the summer, but then how is it going to be part of the student experience then? And um, they have an orientation program training for joining the Discord. There's an experience that's thought through when you join, what's the process? Thinking about Probably for a lot of people, this might be the first time they're on Discord. How are they being welcomed? How are they being educated? There's, you know, like a whole slide deck that they get that walks them through very visually. And again, they've got students, just like you would assign students to be at a table or give a talk that are assigned in those spaces in different communities to engage and moderate. And there's also guidelines we have lots of like community standards. We might need some of those in digital spaces too. 
um, because things happen, no matter if it's in person or online. And again, those are communicated clearly up front. Um, and you also aren't making it all about, you know, just NYU. Like, I want to see a thread about everybody's like childhood pics or your puppies that you miss. Like, it's mm -hmm. just we, we're trying to find the human experience in addition to, okay, the reason why you're on this Discord is you're a first-year student at this university. But what are the other elements that we can integrate? Like, of course, there's going to be lots of talk about, like, living on campus or where your class is going to be. But I find the most active channels and or content that gets posted, no matter what platform it is, is goes beyond the institutional type of messages um, we sprinkle those in because we need to we need, we need information out there um, and to make sure that you know especially for first year students they know and they understand but it that's why my whole approach to social strategy is around community building because unfortunately a lot of accounts like student affairs listen up <laughs> we have bulletin boards in our buildings that's it. Social media cannot be that. Um, if you are posting flyers, and even if they're really pretty, um, I guarantee they will not be as engaged with or received as if you were to create original content that is like storytelling, especially. You're featuring your community. You're making them feel seen. A flyer doesn't make anyone feel seen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, but, uh, well, yeah. And I think that those are like really specific examples of like, you know, sort of the fork in the road of just like, okay, yeah, if you're using it as like a digital bulletin board, it's like, like, it can't just be that. I like, it, it can feature that. It's like, yeah, we want a social boost, you know, events that are going on and try to drive people towards like registering for stuff that's going on. But it's like, yeah, you want to bring like, cause it's like part of it's like an exclusivity or something like something where it's like, yeah, like we're kind of tailoring or kind of catering content towards, you know, Twitter versus TikTok or putting it, you know, wherever. Um, so like that being like a really thoughtful thing, because like you said, like the outcome there is students feeling seen, they're, they're uh, kind of hearing and seeing new perspectives and all that. And then like with like a, a Discord example, which is something that I'm like, I love as sort of the, the kind of primary vehicle for sort of continuous dynamic uh, community building uh, in the digital space. But like, uh, what I was thinking of is that like, okay, NYU obviously like set up that space, put all the students in there and probably, you know, set up the kind of baseline channels. And, you know, they're at least kind of uh, probably doing a lot more of the like transactional stuff of, yeah, like where are your classes, here's the sort of the how to's, but then like, you'd want to make sure that you're not restricting people from like, yeah, creating their own channel for, you know, yeah, pictures of their pets or something. It's like, no, like create whatever channels you want for your friends or, you know, do a group message on there or whatever. Because I think if you're trying to be like, assuming, okay, these are the things that people are going to want to like get to know each other about, you can maybe do a little bit of that. But like, you want to sort of have that kind of like, uh, freedom for these students to start to kind of like build their affinities together and all that, like not being super restrictive and kind of, uh, Having them or at least having limited. a mechanism for them to reach out to say, hey, how about a gamer channel or, you know, I don't know, maybe, well, I doubt if college kids are into Peloton, but I would want a Peloton channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, like a workout channel or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, wellness and fitness and, um, but what I would see on the reverse, so I was on, I was the co-chair for the NASPA virtual experience in 2022. We built a Discord for the conference. They're doing another one this year. And we almost went overboard. Like we included too many channels, or at least this is a feedback we got because we were trying to be too much all of a sudden. And I do think it was not only, so I mean, no surprise, NASPA, like it's adults that this majority of people joining had never even heard of or had been on discord before so it was a shocker i think even though i was like oh my gosh everything's hopping and exciting and so i noticed i'm not on the planning committee this year but i noticed the discord has less channels it's even more directive with some menu options um, and so i would say that's the other piece is any platform or digital community tool you're using 
put in some opportunities for feedback and evaluation. Obviously, a conference already includes elements like that. Um, and so, you know, bring in your toolkit for assessment that you apply for everything else for these digital programs um, so you can improve on the fly or what the next iteration is going to be because that was really important for us to know about too. Yeah. Well, and yeah. And even like, I mean, asking like proactively requesting and, you know, opening yourself up to the feedback, but you can even just gauge where like, oh, well, this is like getting more or less sort of engagement or traction response and all that. Like you might, because you're like, oh, we made all these channels. And I was like, oh, uh, people used half of them. Like there's literally no activity in certain ones. So it's like, yeah. Well, no, it was like, interesting. You know. They were all very, very active. Oh, yeah. But I think there was this feeling of anxiety and like, because they were, it was almost like too much happening. It was, it was interesting. Like, like not all engagement is good engagement for some people. Um, and anyway, I would say also don't discount other tools, even though I am a huge fan of discord. Um, you got to know where your people are and, or what your campus will honestly allow. So some campuses haven't been down for discord. I have seen Microsoft teams, a, channel there well set up at Rutgers Honors College um do fairly well now it may not be as like spicy and dicey as discord because of you don't get some of the bells and whistles but students are integrated into that community it already kind of has that honors college feel um and then like we know there's more quote-unquote adults on Facebook and so if you're thinking about some adult learners or, you know, parents, alumni, donors, know some places they're already hanging out. I would not create a Discord for parents. I That's just me. That would be a big leap. Um, mm. And plus, parent communities tend to be the most saucy I've heard. <laughs> <So. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point too. Yeah. Because I, I honestly, like, I wanted to ask about advice and I'll, I'll give like any, like another sort of opportunity for like last sort of, you know, your go-to uh, advice and everything. But this is what's great. I think because, you know, it's understanding how you have to kind of, you know, like thread the needle. Like it is sort of a very kind of intentional sort of focused kind of perspective that you have to have of, you know, kind of what you're building, why, where you're building it and how you're sort of because it's sort of like keeping it sustainable and continuous. Cause I can imagine even like um, something like you said for like an orientation uh, digital community is that it still kind of feels like disjointed. Like it sort of like loses its sort of appeal or seeming purpose or connection yep. after like, it's like, well, it's my first semester. Like I am oriented, like I'm done. Like, and you just sort of like, we might have like, no, like it should feel sort of like, you know, uh, sort of a seamlessly integrated into you know, like, especially like a first year experience where it's like, no, we're still going to leverage that and use it, um, you know, through this experience to kind of have that continuity. But I guess I'm, I'm curious, cause I think I, I'd imagine, um, you know, platforms like Slack, Teams, Discord, these things that we're mentioning, and certainly TikTok is, is having its, its moment right now that definitely like, you know, accelerated a lot over uh, the past couple of years with like the pandemic and everything. But like, what have been like the trend lines here that you've seen like over the past few years? Because obviously, like everybody was forced to so like solely be utilizing digital communities to kind of connect and everything. But now I think, you know, with more people being exposed, I'm sure the nature of them or sort of the ubiquity or all that has sort of been reshaped as well, because like it, it is the idea that I think in a perfect world, it kind of fits in this sort of hybrid space where it's like, you can have this sort of asynchronous continuous engagement going on in the digital space that can sort of be a catalyst for, yeah, let's all get together to go to the dining hall together or, you know, do some sort of event or something like it's, it's allowing that more, uh, kind of ongoing uh, community building to be happening that can sort of supplement and augment and kind of uh, serve uh, even like a, you know, a residence hall community. It's like, yeah, we're all living in the same floor, but we get to have this sort of place where you can send gifts to each other and do whatever, or share resources and all that kind of stuff. So what are the things that you're noticing as kind of trend lines as we're coming out of uh, the pandemic? Well, Goodness, I mean, it was all quite trial by fire. And what I think last year was, as we were entering back into, you know, like more in person, is we were trying to do our best to do both, 
to continue online and in person um, in basically hybrid modalities. But that is twice as much work. And I do think in some circumstances it is worth it. We're talking about orientation a lot, but for someone to be able to still experience orientation for maybe financial reasons, not being able to get to campus, to be able to experience that in a remote possibility, I think is honestly kind of critical that we be able to provide that. That's just like neither here nor there. But I do think there's some traditions and ways of thought of things that have to be in person that really could be a better fit fully 100% online, that not everything needs to be hybrid. Not So I think we are still, there are some campuses, I don't want to fit all higher ed in this, that like then just completely were like, okay, that was that was that we're going we're going to forget all that we learned about online because this is who we are in person and so now we've just scrapped all that and it's not even on the table anymore also we have some now that are like well no we want to do both but positions and expectations have not been modified so for example if you want to have a discord for everyone that lives on campus and the resident directors are going to manage it well, what are they not going to do now? Because you're asking them to do this other thing. Basically, like they're on call even more. <laughs> right? uh -huh, like, uh -huh. do not take this like, example. All the RDs are yelling at me right now. Um, <laughs> because like what, what is going to give? This stuff takes time. Whether if it is a TikTok, it's a new email newsletter, that we still need to balance the scales. Um, and that is why I'm trying to slow people down, honestly, before going out and creating all these tools. Most of these tools are free, but our time is not. And so I think that's the trend right now is we are trying to balance the scales. Um, I, and honestly, I'm closing a lot more accounts down now than I'm getting campuses and divisions of opening them to, again, like, let's really get focused because... Yeah, I don't I don't see more time on the horizon that we need to we need to strategize around that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it's just uh definitely uh, something I've noticed kind of broadly, like not even just exclusively for digital community building, you know, tools and platforms is that just like, you know, we were implementing a myriad of, you know, ed tech again because we had to and then you're seeing some people were like well we're not going to do it anymore because we don't have to so they're just totally like chucking it you know uh, out the window others who are trying to honor what was and try to get a little bit back to you know in person and stuff and like you said it's like i love that model but it is like the acknowledgement of like it takes twice as much work if you're going to do both like well versus like doing you know kind of a half job on on each of you know uh, right because i'm thinking yeah. of it with like conference conferences too where like there's ones where i've seen like really impressive you know concurrent digital experiences and all this kind of stuff and they're just like like we hope to keep being able to do that like they're not making like commitments of like we're gonna do this more and more each year it's like if we can, I mean, because it's a lot of work. We're basically running like two concurrent, you know, events and stuff. So it's like, you know, that that's a, I think a, a sobering but necessary sort of like, you know, uh, sort of acknowledgement. And then, uh, yeah, just like, I think that sort of big point too of like really trying to grapple with, you know, what is going to be best suited for in-person versus online. And then like, yeah, what, what platforms are we going to keep or get rid of and uh, those sort of things. So it's definitely like a lot of, you know, hard decisions and sort of that, that assessment, that analysis and, you know, getting that feedback and everything just to really track with like, you know, this is where our students are, what they like to use, what, what feels right for us and our, you know, our, our culture, our brand and our people and uh, those sort of things. So I think that's, um, Definitely, yeah, like a big trend line less of just like, oh, yeah, TikTok's great. That's the trend. It's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like it's a, it's a cool new platform. People like to use it, but it's like still just within the bounds of like, we've got to just really kind of analyze like, yeah, if, if we're doing this, like what else are we going to get rid of? Like we got to, we got to, you know, balance well, the scales. Going back is a good to one. the time and trying to do double work, I'm sure you've gone to a conference or I have where 
I was an online participant and then there was an in-person thing too. And I felt like a stepchild. Like it was just, it felt, it wasn't, I wasn't feeling seen. It was, you know, and so can you do both well? Or, you know, or maybe there's less sessions that are virtual. And again, that that cost is going to be equated to that um, because, you know, stuff takes work. And so we need to put infrastructure behind it, time, people, the technology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thoughtfulness of our, you know, yeah, the resources, all the above, yeah, the time, people, dollars and everything. Um, Because, yeah, you want to try to streamline everything, get it all integrated together. And, um, you know, I, I mean, you've shared an immense amount of incredible advice already so far. But if there's other just little kind of like offshoot, like a, kind of tips or tricks or sort of things that you can think of in this area of digital community building, because I think, you know, it is simple in theory. Like you want to sort of organize sort of groups and clubs and events and like all these sort of things like in spaces. And there's a lot of different tools and approaches to doing that. But um, yeah, just other things for people to be thinking about um, when they're thinking about how they're going to be approaching uh, digital community building for their students. It can happen anywhere that you could build a community through an email newsletter um, that there are pros and cons of creating spaces that are more contained. For example, a Slack that someone literally can only join if they have this link versus something that's more open, like how you have an Instagram account. Um, again, it kind of all goes down to intention and strategy and who you want to connect with. I would say with community building, the big goal is engagement. It's two-way. So again, we have to kind of take off our information and like always asking people to do stuff hat and get into the work of engagement like we do so much on campus. But within digital context, it also asks us to maybe behave in ways I mean, almost not like like how we do icebreakers, right? People can like poke fun at student affairs about this, but like we're really good at them, okay? We know how to get people together and make these connections. You have We have to learn those skill sets for social because it is actually quite hard. So mm. it might mean you share a meme or a photo or a video that gets a spark going, the last thing, there is research coming out within digital communities and just social media in general that if our goal, and I do think it is, is to really make real relationships, connections, and an impact, you need to integrate some opportunities to take it beyond the digital space. And, and I'm saying digital space where we aren't actually interacting and talking to each other like you and I are right now. I can see you. I can read your emotions. So even if that is on Zoom, I mean, some of these tools, you can actually turn your screens on and jump in right then. But I think for campuses that are already leveraging in-person stuff, integrate your digital community with in-person engagements, make it an integrated strategy. Um, so then they can both in the end, as we all want to engage students, see them successful, Again, as I kind of started, digital communities can be part of that toolkit and not just um, another thing that you're going to just kind of try and see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a huge thing because I think like prior or like, you know, like early days, it would feel maybe like, you know, yeah, just sort of this like offshoot island or you're like you're doing certain things that are just like for online students so that they have like a, a, a you know, environment to interact in and everything. But yeah, like sort of the, you know, the intentionality, the integration. Um, and I think like another thing just to like try to bold and underline, because I really don't want it to be kind of like overlooked by anybody listening is like what you're saying of like noise for its own sake is not good either. Like, because that's the idea of like an icebreaker as, you know, lampooned as they might be at its core is an intentional sort of like introductory and engagement thing to try to like get people to know each other to like find like, Oh, we both like the same thing or we have some shared experience or, you know, some other affinity. And 
Like, is it like that's the thing that's going to sustain that? It'd be like, you know, oh, we both like basketball. Like, you go into the game on Saturday. Like, you know, like that's just kind of like how you kind of naturally flow from those things. Okay. That you want to try to like, you know, get people to navigate that because otherwise it is like, yeah, you cram a bunch of people into a room, they'll probably start chattering and they'll be like noisy. Be like, wow, look at this. This is great. But it's like, who knows? They could be talking about just like the weather or something. I don't know. Like, it's like not like they'll just all make small talk and they'll be like, yep. see it never, I guess. Like, bye. Like, I don't even know like who you are. Yeah, like, like, yeah. um, so like that, like you want it to kind of be like, you know, that right level of like structure is always sort of my perspective, like lightly structured networking is kind of like kind of the magic ratio that you're always trying to strive for where you're not like, you know, dictating what people talk about, but you're kind of like, like you said, kind of giving that like initial kind of inspiration or, you know, that, that something to kind of break the ice and get them towards uh, finding something that can kind of deepen and, you know, allow for them to make, you know, some sort of uh, ongoing, you know, connection that can be kind of flowing, you know, in person and out where it's like, yeah, we're like, you know, chatting, texting all this, and then we're going to meet up and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, and, well, I think that goes yeah. back to early days of Twitter when like essay chat was super active. Like, again, it was semi structured, you know, some people, of course, very performative, but you'd connect with someone, DM them, maybe or just follow each other, eventually see each other at a conference, then all of a sudden, you're following each other on Facebook. And I mean, there's stories of people then like being in each other's weddings that again, Twitter is the tool, not a perfect one. But the ultimate goal, right, is like deeper, meaningful connections. But you have to be intentional even as the user. And that might be something we need to teach students or whoever's in our community too, is this is how you actually get the most out of this um, platform, not just logistically how to use it. Yeah. And that's like the the emotional gooey core of all this too, is that like, yeah, you want people to feel such a level of like connection, belonging, acceptance, safety, respect, and all that to where it's like, yeah, like this, like, you know, exists beyond the bounds of like, yeah, we just went to the same school. Once we graduated, it's like, then it sort of fizzles out. It's like, no, like we really like, you know, you, you made some level of, you know, deeper connection. So it's like that throughout your time at the institution, you feel, you know, that it is a supportive place and, you know, place where, uh you know it, it's just like it's fun it's enjoyable it's it's again like it's it's a safe place you know like it's a place where you can uh feel accepted for who you are and have that belonging and then you know you would hope that some of those kind of threads are strong enough to kind of uh exist as you graduate and go on to the rest of your life and everything so um we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I love all of it. It is it is good stuff to kind of have this uh, GM session about or just kind of talking through <laughs> advice and strategy and sort of, you know, why all this is important and all of that. But we will end uh, with our question that we're asking everybody. I'm very curious uh, for your answer. What does a connected campus look and or feel like to you? Well, maybe I take what saying you just said is ooey gooey. No, <laughs> that, was a, that was a fun, that was a fun descriptor. Um, a connected campus, I think, as we think about integration, whether if it's online or on campus, but I think we also need to make connections in all types of elements to really know who are actually our students, like as we look at demographics or what are actually their needs. And, and not just like seeing the statistics, but then making those changes. Like we hear the saying, meet students where they are, but like, are we really meeting them emotionally, physically, like spirit? Like, but again, not to just like check those boxes off because I think that is disruptive, honestly, of how a lot of campuses are approaching the work because it's not how we've always done it. Um, so I think a connected campus is kind of coming to terms and starting to make moves on that. Yeah. I mean, I think it really encapsulates a lot of like what we talked about is like sort of the seamless integrated, you know, like it's the campus is connected. So there's like, ideally, yeah, that like kind of, uh, kind of concurrent ongoing kind of digital community that exists like the whole time you're a student. And then certainly, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, faculty and staff to kind of have their own sort of spaces so that they can, you know, talk shop and support each other. Like you'd, you'd want that for every kind of stakeholder um, in the university community, uh, be it alumni or parents Absolutely. and all these sort of yeah, things. We didn't, and, we didn't yeah. talk a lot about staff need community too. 
new new faculty uh inter international anything like there are so many pockets of your community that you could have micro communities for a group me for a dozen new faculty i think would be so fascinating to be part of cuz mm-hmm. they're you know like figuring or like everyone going through tenure together I don't know if I'd yeah. be on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, yeah. Well, because I think it's like, uh, yeah, there's like shared experience, like an orientation right, or whatever. Exactly. It's like shared whatever that, yeah, like whatever that is, it can also be something that even when that experience is over, you have that as sort of a tie that binds because it's like, yeah, we went through that arduous alternative spring break at, yep, you know, who totally. knows where. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, a lot of this can have applicability in whatever the sort of little pocket community might be. But uh, yeah, a connected campus is, yeah, it's, it's robust, it's vast, it's diverse, it's dynamic, and but it does require all the advice and tips and tricks and tools that we talked about to be used in kind of an intentional, uh, thoughtful way. And yeah, I mean, the outcome again is that that ooey gooey center, that that emotional belonging. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. I mean, I appreciate you so much for for hanging out. We'll have ways to connect with you and all the awesome work that you do uh, in the show notes for this episode. But yeah, just thank you so much for hanging out and sharing all your perspectives. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Connected Campus. Please leave a five star review for the show and share it so others can discover us. Make sure to also subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode of The Connected Campus.